Hey guys, I decided to do something different um, today. So you all know I'm big into my true crime. I bought this book a few years ago. It's called Murder Most Local, Historic Murders of East Cork. And it was put together by a guy called Peter O'Shea, right? Um, so this is all local murder stories that this guy, you know, did his research into and put the book together, okay? Now, this was the first book he came out with. This is East Cork. He's since done a West Cork, South Cork, North Cork, and then he's done, the fifth one is, I forget, I think it's just a general. Anyway, and he is coming out with a new one, I think, at the moment. But the very first story in the book is called She Tried Her Best to Avoid Him, Lisinski Cove, 1880. So there it is. That's where I'm from, and this story is about some sort of a great great grand aunt of mine. I'd also like to say, I know I told Heather, I don't know if I said it on live or if I said it backstage, but my mother had originally wanted to call me Prudence. Um, but this woman in the story was murdered, and another Prudence caught her was or she died young of TB. I think she was 19. This woman was 22. So my mother was too superstitious, so she called me Jacqueline instead, okay? So, I'm going to read this story. It's only a few pages, but the guy, I did get on to the guy who put this book together afterwards, after I got the book and read the story, and I said, look, just to let you know, you actually missed the end of the story, and he said, I know, he says, your aunt was on to me, and she gave me the documentation, whatever, so I'll briefly describe them what happened afterwards, okay? So I'm going to read the story. It's not that long, don't worry. So, the Cotter family lived in a quiet part of Great Island about a mile north of the town of Cove in the townland of Lisinski. Like any other rural place in Ireland, it, com compromise, it comprised, Jesus, I can't even say words, it comprised mostly of farmers and those that worked for farmers. Mary Prudence Cotter was the do daughter of a local farmer. She was only 22 years old and still living at home with her father, James, and her mother, Catherine, and her younger brother, James, aged 20. On Sunday the 29th of February 1880, she went out with two sisters, Hannah and Mary Cashman, to visit some neighbours. The group were visiting a nearby farm belonging to John Higgins in the townland to the south called Ballyleary. They walked down the road and took a short cut, short cut across some fields to get to the farm. When crossing the fields, they met a neighbour called Patrick Allen who asked to speak to Mary. He said to her, Surely, Miss Cotter, it is not from me you are running away. I want to say something to you. Mary replied sternly to him, What is it? And he said, Tis not much, as he was really only trying to get her attention. Hannah and Mary Cashman walked ahead, leaving the two talking. The sisters waited in the next field for Mary Cotter to catch up. Mary had known Patrick since childhood and he seemed to have an attachment towards her. In their younger days, they were courting each other for a while. However, Alan had been in the lunatic asylum for a period. Since then, she no longer encouraged him and even tried her best to avoid him. Over the years, she had come to dislike him more and more and had recently become afraid of him. For some reason, he wasn't taking the hints and kept trying to approach her, becoming annoyed with her lack of interest in him. That day, whatever transpired between them, ten minutes later, she ran crying after the two Cashman girls. She told the sisters that Patrick Allen had hit her a clout on the cheek with a closed fist. Mary was quite upset over what happened and no longer wanted to go to the Higgins' house. She feared meeting Allen again, and the Cashman sisters offered to walk her home. Mary too told her two companions that she would be fine, if she went home by the road where he wouldn't do anything to her. It was now after four in the afternoon and what the sisters didn't know yet was that they would never see their friend alive again. At 20, 20 minutes to five, two other women were out for a walk. Near a small cottage, they found the body of a young woman lying on the road. There was blood all over the road and her head was badly beaten in. The women ran on and told an old man who they thought would do something, but he didn't and went on his way. The nearest farm to the cottage was said to be occupied by an elderly, deaf man. This was probably him. 
Coincidentally, they met Dr. Corbett walking up the road. He subsequently took charge of the situation and sent someone for the police. Later, a large posse of police arrived from the town. They inspected the body and the scene of the crime on the road. After hearing what had occupied earlier, occurred earlier, sorry, they arrested Patrick Allen at his uncle David Burke's house. For the last year after being released from the asylum, he'd been helping out at his uncle's farm. When the police arrived there around there uh, when the police arrived there around seven, they found Alan in bed. He made no statement, nor did they find any traces of blood on his clothes. Nonetheless, Patrick Allen was arrested and placed in custody in the nearest barracks in the town. An inquest was held on the 2nd of March by Coroner Rice. A jury of 13 men from the locality were sworn in. As the accused Patrick Allen was not brought before the jury, the evidence called would only show the cause of death. Dennis McCarthy, another farmer in the townland of Lisniski, was called to give evidence as he lived near the murder scene. Dr Corbett had just left his house that afternoon but returned minutes later saying there was a body of a young girl on the road. McCarthy quickly returned to the scene with Corbett and saw the huge pool of blood on the road. There was nobody else seen around at that time. Between them they moved the body to Donahue's cottage nearby and raised the alarm. Dr Downing told the jury that on Sunday the 29th of February he was called to attend the scene. That evening he carried out a superficial examination of the body finding severe head injuries. There were five lacerated wounds on the head, all penetrating the skull. The doctor said the in injuries seemed to have been inflicted by a lar large, sharp, triangular shaped stone. The coroner, after hearing the evidence, returned an open verdict. He said Mary Cotter met her death from injuries caused by some persons unknown. Later that day, a huge crowd attended Mary Cotter's funeral, which proceeded to Carrick Tool Graveyard. On Sunday the 4th of March, a special sitting of the Petty Sessions was held at Queenstown Courthouse to investigate if there was a case to answer. Several magistrates sat on the bench, including Mr Beamish and Mr Starkey, while Mr Rice from Fermoy prosecuted for the Crown. The accused was brought to court and placed among four other men so the witnesses could identify him. He had no solicitor to represent him, but despite this he appeared quite cool in court. He displayed also no signs of insanity whatsoever. A huge crowd gathered at the courthouse in the town to catch a glimpse of the man accused of this brutal murder. Mary Cashman bravely gave her side of the story, telling how she was with Mary Cotter just before she was murdered. The Cashman sisters were more than likely the last to have seen her alive. She recalled how Mary's cheek was red after being struck by Alan in the field. Afterwards, she said Patrick Allen headed in the direction of the road leading to Cotter's house. The girls waited a few minutes in the field, deciding what they were going to do, hoping Alan was gone. Mary Cotter headed through the fields towards the road. Meanwhile, Hannah and Mary Cashman went in the opposite direction towards Higgins' farm. It was over an hour later when Mary Cashman heard the news that her friend Mary Cotter had been killed. Her sister gave the same evidence of what had happened that day. The next witness, Hannah Grogan, told how she was walking on the road from Carrigalow to Lisniski on the afternoon in question. Near a little cottage in, little, in Lisniski, they met a man on the road. She identified that man as the prisoner in court, Patrick Allen. It was 20 minutes past four when she saw him, but there was no body on the road at this time. The hearing was adjourned until the 11th of March, when the remainder of the witnesses would be heard. The following Thursday, the court sat again and the accused displayed the same calm expression in the court. Dennis McCarthy was called again and he told how he had helped Dr Corbett move the body off the road and into Donahue's cottage. After giving the same evidence of events as he did previously, he now added more information. He said he knew Mary Cotter and the accused quite well. In the past, he often saw them together, but not since Patrick had come out of the asylum. However, about three months before he saw them walking, talking on the road, Patrick said to her, how are you, Mary? But she replied, don't speak to me. Patrick referred to their past relationship, saying, 
You would speak to me one time. Mary Cotter took up a stone, threw it at him, but missed. Dennis recalled a more recent conversation he had with the accused. Patrick told him, if I thought this girl above put me in the asylum, I'd have her life. He knew that Alan was referring to Mary Cotter and pointed out that he would suffer for it if he did anything to her. Alan told McCarthy that he would do it when nobody was looking. He also said he had a hatchet and intended to cut out her heart and feed it to the dogs. Oh, good God, lads. Um, That's gross. Dr. Downing was called next and told how he had called, how he was called to Donahue's cottage that evening of the murder to inspect the body. He gave testimony similar to the inquest, stating how Mary had suffered five blows to the head. The doctor also told how there were also wounds on her hands from trying to protect herself. The first blow was struck on the pole of the head and the doctor concluded that would have been enough to kill her. A farm servant called Hannah Savage was next called to the stand and told the court that she worked at Dennis McCarthy's farm. The evening before the murder, Mary Cotter, who she knew well, came into McCarthy's farmhouse. Not long after Patrick Allen arrived, as if he was following Mary, because he was not in the habit of going there normally. He spoke to Mary, but she didn't reply to him at all. Not getting any satisfaction from her, he spoke to Hannah, saying Mary didn't care for much, as she was to be married soon. He sat down alongside Mary on the bench she occupied. Mary got up and avoided him by going to the well for water with Hannah. She didn't want to be left alone with Patrick. Hannah said that Mary left ten minutes later, but Patrick Allen followed her and wouldn't leave her alone. Mary ran back to McCarthy's farmhouse, ran inside and locked the door. Finding herself trapped, she climbed out the kitchen window on the other side of the house and made her escape. Hearing this evidence, the accused spoke for the first time, saying, Did I run after Mary Cotter? No. Don't you think that I could have caught her if I wished? David Burke, uncle of the accused, told of the nephew's movements that Sunday afternoon. They had their dinner at three and Patrick Allen left the house an hour after. He didn't return home until half past six, at which time he went to bed. The police arrived 10 minutes later and arrested him. So that proves that he was out for those couple of hours when she was murdered. Burke told how the clothes Alan wore all day were those he was arrested in. Catherine Cotter, mother of the deceased, was called next. Before the magistrates, she said how she was unaware that her daughter was at one time courting Patrick Allen. She added, though, that they were very young then. Allen, say, uh, Allen, she said, was often at their house back then. Since being released from the asylum, Mary no longer encouraged him, but he kept coming back. Several times Catherine Cotter told him that he wasn't wanted there as her daughter was annoyed and upset when he called. As the evidence was also circumstantial, there were many witnesses needed to build a case against Patrick Allen. Even so, nobody actually saw him murder Mary, but all the witness statements placed him near the scene. They also showed that he was in the habit of confronting Mary Cotter and how she tried to avoid him. It took two more days in court, where many more witnesses told that they saw that day and the goings on of Patrick Allen, what they saw that day and the goings on of Patrick Allen. The most interesting witness was one farmer of the locality, Jay Connell. His testimony shows John L., uh, Patrick Allen's frame of mind after the murder took place. Connell told how Allen arrived at his house between five and six that evening. So this was in the hour before he was arrested. He told Connell how he had hit a girl earlier and seemed to be very worried. After several days of hearing evidence, the magistrates quickly came to a decision on the 17th of March. Despite nobody seeing the murder and the accused making no statement, the magistrates obviously felt that they had heard enough. They returned the case of... Oh, I'm, I'm, I skipped a line. Hold on now. Um, <laughs> they 
They returned the case to trial before a jury at the next assizes. I, I don't know what that word is. And all the witnesses were bound over to attend again. As Patrick Allen still had no legal re representation, he was asked if he had anything to say before the court, but he refused. The case was called at the Cork Summer Assizes in June before Justice Barry. A solicitor named Mr Green from the Crown applied for a postponement of the case as the accused was currently being held in the lunatic asylum. He said there was no point in taking him out of it. The judge agreed and postponed the case until the next assizes in December. On the 14th of December, the case was finally called at the Cork Winter Assizes before Judge Fitzgerald, Justice Fitzgerald. Solicitor Mr Roach defended the case while four Queen's Council solicitors prosecuted. The judge said before the court that he had already adjourned several cases until January. When asked about another case, he quipped that he hadn't the time to adjourn it today and needed to press on with the current one. Evidence for the prosecution was next called. First to the stand was Dennis Mulcahy who gave circumstantial evidence while well, the accused had told, which the accused had told him. Sometime before the murder, Alan told him how Mary Cotter was the reason he had gone to the lunatic, oh my God, lunatic asylum. He also told Mulcahy he was going to murder Mary Cotter. Roach spoke for the prisoner and addressed the jury. He said if Patrick had committed the crime, he was not responsible on account of being insane. This was the whole of the case for the defence. Medical Superintendent of the Cork Lunatic Asylum, Dr. Eames, these are all very funny foreign names, was next examined in court. He told how he had known Patrick Allen, who had been an inmate from July 1876 until released in February 1879. So he was in the Lunatic Asylum for three years. Wow. He told how occasionally Alan became extremely violent and uncontrollable. Several times he assaulted the attendants there. It normally happened when he was interfered with and he went out of his mind with fury. Alan had been quiet for the last year before being released, but the doctor said these types of patients could have sudden relapses. Alan had been readmitted to the asylum on June 3rd, over three months after the murder. When the doctor was questioned by the judge, he replied that jealousy would indeed be a cause to excite, excite the accused to a state of fury. Dr Townsend, another doctor in the asylum, gave similar evidence having experienced Patrick Allen's state of mind also. As the defence's case was only trying to prove the prisoner's insanity, Mr Roach told the court that there were several more doctors present. They were also willing to give testimony having been in charge of Patrick Allen at some point of his custody. The judge, however, had heard enough and said there was no need to hear any more medical evidence. Mr Roach for the defence summed up the case and asked the jury for his client insane, find his client insane and not responsible for the crime he had committed. The jury only needed a short time to deliberate and returned to the courtroom with the verdict. They found that Patrick Allen was not guilty on the grounds of insanity. The judge ordered the prisoner to be detained at the Lord Lieutenant's pleasure, which was in effect, which in effect was indefinitely. And that is the end of the story in the book, right? However, what happened afterwards, and like I said, I contacted the guy who put the book, who put the book together, but my aunt had already sent the information on to him. Um, he escaped from the lunatic, lunatic asylum that he'd be put back into and he got on a boat and headed to America. Now, in my mind, God only knows what he did in America, okay? We don't know. But after a few years, he got homesick and he came home and he made the clever decision to go back to his hometown and inspect where he had murdered her and luckily the friends and family neighbors whatever uh, recognized him straight away and called the police and he was taken away and locked up properly so there was somewhat of a happy ending to the story at least but 
still an absolutely insane story if you think about it. Um, it never occurred to me before. I only, only thought of it now. I must actually pull some cards later on it and just see what comes up from my amazing haunted house tarot because I'm obsessed with this deck. So I must pull some cards and kind of just make a short little video and, and put that up. Um, there's also another one. Now, it's not something I could read for you because it's something from the 1800s as well. And it's it's from the Cork Journal of Historic... What is this? The JCHAS. Journal of the Cork Historical and Archaeological Society. JCHAS. Um, on, again, an ancestor of mine, a James Cotter, who was hung. He was the last person to be hung in um, the jail in Cork, or the courthouse in Cork City, where they did the hangings back in the, sorry, that was the late 1700s, I think. Um, he was hung on trumped up charges. He he was, I don't understand all this um, political crap, but there was Quakers and there was um, what's the other one? Jacobites, Jacobites, however you pronounce it. Uh, he was one and the opposition didn't like him and they had they paid off some woman to say he was in a, a pub in Fermoy and this woman was drunk and he offered her a lift home lift home on his horse and cart and he took her home and put her into her house and went on his way but they paid him to sorry they paid her to say that he scandalized her which was the term they used back then, which is much better than the R word, which I don't say because it's disgusting. But he was um, found guilty because he was paid by, or because they were paid by so many people to to have him hung, and he was hung. And she admitted then afterwards that she was in fact paid by the opposition. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, I couldn't be reading that because it's all in very old Irish English and I can't even understand it, let alone be expecting anyone else to read it. But I do have um, the guy who put that journal together back in the day. Um, it, it's a very old copy, kind of made, put those paperwork together for us um, and sent it to my family, you know, a long, long time ago. Uh, I must find it in short tea at least, but it's just, it's hard to understand. But yeah, that's another one I'd just like to pull to pull cards on anyway, you know. Um, I mean, I could read the basic introduction from that little book um, and pull cards on it. So that's another one I'll do. But this one on my lovely great, great, whatever, granite Mary Prudence Cotter, I just thought people would like to hear. So that's the story. So... He brutally murdered her on the side of the road and was put in a lunatic asylum, proven not guilty by insanity, escaped, headed off to America. Like I said, God only knows what he did over there, but was homesick after a few years and came home and luckily went back to our homeland and was recognised and locked up. So somewhat happy ending to the story so let me know what you think guys i think this is a fascinating story so i hope it'll be of interest to you and like i said i will have to pull cards too and see what i come up with so thanks a million for watching guys talk to you soon bye